Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. Before we begin, please be aware, we have a tendency to swear. You have been warned, make no mistake, so join us now. We're We're for Fox Fox sake. Sake. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Carly, and the espressoed up Gryffindor to my right is Ellen. It's true, I had espresso. This is going to be a really good episode. Is it? Is it? Is it? I think is so. it? Is I think it? it is. I'm just flying. Flying? I'm flying. Flying right into the Phoenix flashback. Into it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 12, Silver and Opals, and the corresponding film scenes. Okay, well, maybe you need to slow down. Okay. Just this I'll try that. Our book and movie scenes lined up pretty well. Katie Bell gets caught in a cursed situation when she accidentally touches a weird necklace she found in the loo. Leanne is distraught in the book, but less so in the movie. Sassy Snape is always present in the movie and constantly questioning Dirty Harry on his accusations against Malfoy. Ron and Hermione are so tired of Harry's bullshit, they blatantly argue with him in front of McGonagall. The book ends with Ron and Hermione ignoring Harry after another theory about Malfoy, while the movie ends with Harry and Ron talking about Ginny and Hermione's nice skin. During episode 217, Dirty Harry... Our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts on how the movie portrays Harry's accusations of Malfoy compared to how the book does it? Hi, this is Jessica calling in my pondering. Yeah, so it's really frustrating how much they cut out of this movie just in general, but then specifically with Draco and Harry's obsession with what he's up to and everything. I mean, aside from the train and then a little bit later when he's looking at the map and stuff, and sure, he blames Draco for, like, the cursed necklace and we don't find out that he wasn't in Hogsmeade in the movie either, so there's no, like, alibi of course he didn't do it. He's just uh uh-huh, uh-huh, Draco did it. And then he, they're just like, oh, you just know. But but there's not like, he can't have done it, you know? It's just, mm, it's frustrating. And I know Harry, like, follows Snape and Draco and listens in on them, but it's still almost as if, like, he couldn't care less in the movie because compared to the book where he's constantly talking about it and bringing it up so much that Hermione and Ron are getting so annoyed with him. And then when he recruits Creature and Dopey to watch him, but you don't even see the house elves at all in the movie. Like, why cut that out? We get little peeks into what Draco's doing, but they're the wrong crumbs and clues of what he's actually up to and what his mission from Voldemort is. The bits in the roof of requirement and the bird and the apple? It's just so weird to me. Unless you read the books, you don't really know what that thing is. It's just the weird looking cabinet they saw at Morgan and Burks. Like, and it's like, okay, well, that makes sense not. It just is all the more confusing because the stuff that they did put in has nothing to do with really anything. It's just, I don't even know if anybody really got what he was doing with that. I mean, it was him mending it, but how was he mending it? We don't even know. It's just him sending an apple through. What, but what did he do to get it to work? Like I said, the wrong details are being included and then they're just making shit up. But who cares? Not Harry, apparently, because he's all too happy to let Slughorn collect him rather than avoiding him at all costs and obsessing over Draco. (sighs) Hey guys, Jackson here calling my pot of pondering. Honestly, I didn't mind the differences between the movie and the book about Harry's accusation of Malfoy. Maybe we could have had a bit more of the interaction, learned that he wasn't in Hogsmeade, you know? Could have used a bit more detail, but... I mean, that's just part and parcel, isn't it? (laughs) Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, how much money did Merope get for Slytherin's lockets? Caractacus Burke only gave her 10 galleons for the near priceless locket. Congratulations goes to Kalista White Wolf and Jessica Wallace. Yay! We had to call this one a tie because Jessica was the first one to answer it on Facebook with Kalista being very narrowly behind her within a minute. And Kalista was the first one to answer it on Podbean with Jessica right behind her within a minute. So we're going to say it's a tie, but going forward, we're only going to accept the winning answer from Facebook just to keep that easier for us because that tends to give us the slightly better notification of who posted first. Is one of them going to get there before the other this week? 
Is somebody else going to sweep in and take it? You never know. For now, let's dive into the first half of chapter 13, The Secret Riddle, and the not really corresponding film scenes. Chapter 13, The Secret Riddle, Part 1. The next day, they send Katie to St. Mungle's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. And by this time, everyone in the school knows she has been cursed, though the details are all confused. Only Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Leanne are the ones who know that Katie had not been the intended target, though Harry also insists that Malfoy knows too. Ron and Hermione's new policy is to feign deafness whenever Harry brings up his Malfoy is a Death Eater theory. Harry wonders whether Dumbledore will make it back in time on Monday night for their lesson, but since he doesn't hear otherwise, he heads to his office at 8 o'clock. When he knocks, Dumbledore tells him to enter, and he's sitting at his desk looking tired. His hand is still black, but he smiles as he gestures for Harry to sit down. The pensive is again sitting on the desk, casting silvery light on the ceiling. Dumbledore brings up witnessing Katie's accident, and Harry asks how she is. The headmaster explains that she is still unwell, but was relatively lucky as only a tiny amount of skin touched the necklace through a hole in her glove. Had she put it on or touched it with her ungloved hand, it may have killed her instantly. When he mentions that Professor Snape was able to do enough to prevent a rapid spread of the curse, Harry interrupts him to ask why him and not Madame Pomfrey. Phineas Nigellus Black calls Harry impertinent for questioning how Hogwarts is operated, and Dumbledore politely quiets him by thanking him. He informs Harry that Professor Snape knows more about the dark arts than Madame Pomfrey, but then closes the subject by mentioning getting hourly reports from St. Mungo's staff and saying he is hopeful Katie will make a full recovery. Harry pushes his luck and flat out asks where the headmaster had been that weekend and is surprised that though Dumbledore doesn't tell him, he does say he will in due course. He pulls a bottle of silver memories out of his robes and uses his wand to uncork it as Harry mentions running into Mundungus and Hogsmeade. Dumbledore lets Harry know he is aware of Mundungus's thievery and assures him he will not be taking any more. Phineas Nigellus is angry to learn that mangy half-blood was stealing black heirlooms and stalks out of his portrait to go investigate at number 12 Grimmauld Place. Harry then asks Dumbledore if Professor McGonagall mentioned what he told her about Draco Malfoy after Katie was hurt. The headmaster confirms that he is aware of Harry's suspicions and insists he is taking all appropriate measures to investigate, before returning their topic to the lesson. Harry feels slightly resentful, but stays silent as he watches Dumbledore pour the fresh memories into the pensive. Dumbledore reminds Harry where they left off their tale of Lord Voldemort, with handsome muggle Tom Riddle abandoning his pregnant witch wife, Merope. He returned to his family home in Little Hangleton, leaving Merope alone in London. Harry wonders how he knows she was in London and learns it was from the evidence of Caracatus Burke, one of the founders of the shop the necklace they were just discussing came from. Dumbledore swills the contents of the pensive, and a little old man rises from them. He says they acquired it from a young witch just before Christmas many years ago. She said she needed the gold badly, which was obvious, as she was covered in rags and clearly pregnant. She claimed the necklace had been Slytherin's, and though they hear that sort of thing all the time, she had been telling the truth. The necklace was near priceless, but since she didn't know that, they got it at a bargain ten galleons. Harry is indignant they only gave her ten galleons, and Dumbledore comments that Caracatus Burke was not famed for his generosity. He summarizes that they know that near the end of her pregnancy, Merope was alone in London and desperate enough to sell her only valuable possession. Harry doesn't understand why she didn't use magic to help herself, and Dumbledore theorizes that she stopped using magic when her husband abandoned her. He thinks she didn't want to be a witch anymore, or perhaps that unrequited love sapped her of her powers. Regardless, Merope refused to raise her wand to even save her own life. Harry asks about her not even staying alive for her son, and Dumbledore wonders if he is feeling sorry for Voldemort. He quickly says no, but comments on her having a choice, unlike his mother. Dumbledore reminds Harry that his mother had a choice too, 
But yes, Merope chose death in spite of a son who needed her. He also tells Harry not to judge her too harshly, since she was greatly weakened by long suffering and never had his mother's courage. He then asks him to stand, making Harry wonder where they are going. Dumbledore explains that they're going to enter his memory, which is both rich in detail and highly accurate. He tells Harry to go first, and then joins him on a bustling old-fashioned London street. Dumbledore points himself out as his younger self is crossing the road, wearing a flamboyantly cut suit of plum velvet. His long hair and beard are both auburn, and his suit seems to be drawing many curious looks. Unable to stop himself, Harry says, Nice suit, sir, and Dumbledore chuckles. They follow his younger self through the iron gates into a bare courtyard of a grim, square building surrounded by high railings, and watch as he mounts the steps and knocks on the front door. A scruffy girl in an apron opens it, and he wishes her a good afternoon before saying he has an appointment with the matron, Mrs. Cole. The girl looks bewildered by Dumbledore's eccentric appearance, but calls for Mrs. Cole, then invites him in. Harry and the older Dumbledore follow as he steps into the shabby but spotlessly clean place. A skinny, harassed-looking woman scurries towards them, looking anxious as she talks over her shoulder to another helper. When she takes in his odd appearance, she stops dead in her tracks and gapes when he wishes her good afternoon. He continues speaking, explaining that he is Albus Dumbledore, had sent her a letter requesting an appointment, and that she had kindly invited him there. Mrs. Cole blinks and feebly invites him back to her office, offering him a rickety chair to sit in as she sits across from him at her desk. Dumbledore continues explaining that he is there, as he mentioned in his letter, to discuss Tom Riddle and arrangements for his future. Mrs. Cole wonders if he is family, and he responds that he is a teacher and has come to offer him a place at his school. She asks about the school, and he says it is called Hogwarts. She then wonders why he's interested in Tom, and Dumbledore says they believe he has the qualities they are looking for. She thinks this means he won a scholarship and questions this, as he's never been entered for one. When Dumbledore tries to tell her his name has been down since birth, she wants to know who registered him. As she is clearly an inconveniently sharp woman, Dumbledore slips his wand out of his pocket as he also picks up a piece of blank paper from her desk. He waves his wand as he passes her the paper and claims it will make everything clear. Mrs. Cole's eyes slide in and out of focus as she gazes at the blank paper and declares it to be in order. She then notices a bottle of gin and two glasses that had not been there before and offers him a glass. Dumbledore accepts, beaming, as she pours them each a generous amount before draining her own in one gulp. She then smiles at Dumbledore, who presses his advantage and asks about Tom Riddle's history, confirming he was born in the orphanage. Mrs. Cole helps herself to more gin as she informs him that she had just started there herself and remembers it well. It was New Year's Eve and bitter cold when his mother came staggering up the steps. They took her in and she had the baby within an hour and died the next. She takes another large gulp of gin and Dumbledore asks if she said anything about the boy's father. Seeming to enjoy herself and having an audience, Mrs. Cole says she remembers her saying she hopes he looks like his papa and adds that the girl was right to hope that because she was no beauty. She tells Dumbledore that she told her he was to be named Tom for his father, Marvolo for her father, and his surname was to be Riddle. She died soon after that without another word, and they named him like she said, but no Tom, Marvolo, or any Riddle came looking for him. They kept him at the orphanage, and he's been there ever since. She helps herself to another glass of gin and absent-mindedly calls him a funny boy. Dumbledore tells her he thought he might be, but questions what she means when she tells him he hardly ever cried as a baby and then was odd when he got older. She starts to explain, but pauses to make sure Tom definitely has a place at the school and that nothing she says will change that. When Dumbledore assures her he does, she informs him that he scares the other children. He wonders if she means he is a bully, and Mrs. Cole figures it must be that, but she hasn't been able to catch him at it. 
She mentions nasty incidents, like a thing with Billy Stubbs' rabbit, saying Tom said he didn't do it, and she doesn't see how he could have, but the rabbit didn't hang itself from the rafters. All she knows is that he and Billy argued the day before. She brings up another incident on a summer outing that involved Tom Riddle bringing Amy Benson and Dennis Bishop into a cave for exploring, but they were never quite right afterwards. She looks at Dumbledore and says there have been a lot of funny things, and she doesn't think many people will be sorry to see the back of him. Dumbledore makes sure she knows he will not be keeping him permanently. He will have to return to the orphanage each summer at the very least. Mrs. Cole says that's better than a whack on the nose with a rusty poker and gets to her feet as she asks if he would like to see him. Dumbledore also stands, saying very much, and follows her out of the office and up stone stairs. She calls out instructions and admonitions to the helpers and children as she passes. The orphans are all wearing the same grayish tunic and look reasonably well cared for, but there's no denying it is a grim place to grow up. Mrs. Cole stops in front of the first door on the second landing, knocking before entering. She tells Tom that someone is there to see him, messing up Dumbledore's name a couple of times before just telling him she will let him explain why he's there. Harry and the two Dumbledores enter the small bare room with only a wardrobe, a wooden chair, and an iron bedstead. Mrs. Cole closes the door behind them and they look at the boy sitting stretched out on top of the gray blankets, holding a book. The movie section starts out focusing on the cabinet holding all the memories pertaining to Voldemort, also known as Tom Riddle. It rotates a little and Dumbledore reaches in to pick up a vial, saying it contains the most particular memory of the day he first met him. He holds it up for Harry to see and tells him that he would like him to see it. Harry steps forward and takes the vial from Dumbledore's hand, looking a little apprehensive. He uncorks it as the two walk over to the pensive and then pours the contents into the basin. The memory spreads through the liquid surface like black smoke and Harry bends forward to stick his face into it. The camera transitions through the liquid filled with black smoky figures that gradually solidify into an old London street. A man holding an umbrella walks towards a building as more smoke figures pass by and go in and out of various levels of focus. The camera pans up on the gate surrounding the building with a sign that reads, Wool's Orphanage, and a woman's voice admits to some confusion about Mr. Dumbledore's letter. The scene moves to show a woman leading Dumbledore up a staircase as she explains that in all the years Tom has been there, he's never once had a family member visit. It cuts to them hesitating in the corridor as she explains to him that there have been nasty incidents with the other children, then shifts again to the woman knocking on a door. She pushes it open and says, Tom, you have a visitor. Figuring out where to cut this section was was kind of strange. (laughs) There just wasn't much that happened in the movie scene compared to the book scene. Yeah, the book scene. I like that. that. (laughs) This does line up well. It just takes out so much. And some of it is such delightful stuff, too. Yeah, there's lots of really cool stuff that happens in this scene. But they obviously can't include Katie being sent to St. Mungo's since they never put out that St. Mungo's is a thing in the movies. Hmm. Ever. Hmm. Yeah, that's where the book chapter starts is learning that the next day after this incident with Katie Bell, she's sent to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. And by the time this happens, it's spread around the school that she's been cursed, but nobody really knows what actually happened basically it's just the trio and leanne that know that katie wasn't the target that would be so scary though to be like oh somebody got attacked at the school they got literally cursed i feel like they probably should have made that information known yeah because this kind of attack would make a parent pull their kid out of school i would think and i think people do start pulling their kids out. they already have at this point too pavarti and Padma's parents want to pull them out and she has a conversation with Harry and says that that Katie thing really freaked them out yeah yeah I, would I it think so me out too? I don't know we'll get to it yeah if, if it does I don't remember every detail of the book but we're I remember it pretty refreshing well, but, yeah. as we go through this you know but yeah I think Harry does have a conversation with her 
when Ron and Lav Lav get super close. Yeah. And, and they're just like standing around awkwardly like. And Harry's like, well, I'm glad to see that you guys are still here. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, Harry is also insisting that Malfoy knows too because Malfoy is the one who instigated all of it in his mind and in reality, but nobody else agrees with that yet. <laughs> yet. And then, like I said, Ron and Hermione have just fully adopted the policy of feigning deafness whenever Harry brings up his suspicions about Malfoy being a Death Eater. I can't say that I disagree with them in this moment because I think it would get really boring listening to your friend constantly being like, this guy's a bad guy. And you're like, he's probably not. <laughs> Except that he probably, well, he's not, but he is, but he's not. But Not we'll in the way that, that you think he is. Right. <laughs> Another thing that's been on Harry's mind a lot this weekend is whether or not Dumbledore is actually going to make it back in time for their lesson Monday night. But then since he never hears anything to contrary, he just goes to his office at eight o'clock and knocks on the door and is told to come in. And when he does, he notices that Dumbledore is looking more tired than usual, but Me. smiles. <laughs> he does smile. He's And invites him to sit down. And Harry also notes that his hand is still as black and burned looking as it ever is and that the pensive is out again. It's casting a silvery light on the ceiling. Dumbledore first brings up the fact that Harry witnessed Katie's accident. And I found this really interesting as I was writing up this summary. I noted the fact that whenever Dumbledore is referring to a student, he'll say Miss Granger, Mr. Weasley, Mr. Potter. Like, I mean, he never says that to Harry, but yeah. He calls them by their last name with Mr. or Miss in front of it. He just flat out says, you witnessed Katie's accident. And I feel like that was just in this moment being like, this is a more intimate thing. I'm going to. This is a more yeah. casual moment with you. Yeah, I can agree with that. Harry asks how she's doing and learns that she's not doing great, but was at least relatively lucky. Can't really say lucky. She fucking got cursed and nearly died. But it seems like she just had a tiny hole in her glove that must have grazed the necklace. So the absolute minimum amount of skin touched it. And he says that if she had put it on or held it in her bare hand, She'd be it dead. probably would have killed her instantly. And that Snape was able to do enough to prevent a rapid spread of the curse. I hate this part. I Harry's, hate Harry. Harry's just like, why him and not Madame Pomfrey? Dude. I don't think he said it in that tone, but that's how I read it. When Jim Dale reads it, he reads it in a really defensive way. Like, why him and not Madame Pomfrey? Which, okay, you standing up for Madame Pomfrey, that's kind of what it feels like. But I know he's not. I know it's he's less just like standing up for her and more hating Snape. Yeah. But he actually interrupts Dumbledore to ask this. And I think it's funny that. Phineas Nigellus Black in his portrait. It's just like impertinent. Me too, I've though, never let honestly. a student question how Hogwarts is operated back in my day. Well, and, you tortured people, my friends. Right. So goodbye. You're back in your day. Back in my day. <laughs> and I love that Dumbledore's just like, yes, thank you. Yeah, he's like, shut up. It's like dismissal, but in a polite way. And he does actually answer Harry's question. Like, little reminder, Snape, Professor Snape, because he's yeah, he, always he very always respectful. Says Professor Snape knows more about the dark arts than Madame Pomfrey. It was that's fair. Like literally, Snape at could look at it and look at the necklace and be like, "This is what needs to be done to help her." And Madame Pomfrey probably would be capable of doing it, but she may not immediately know what the curse is on the necklace. It's true. And then he also says that he's getting hourly reports from St. Mungo's staff oh, and says that so he's nice. hopeful Katie will make a full recovery. It kind of makes me wonder. If for a while those reports are just, she's still in a coma, dude. <laughs> she sneezed. Ah, I think that that's the classiest moment for me, seeing Dumbledore as a headmaster. He's really looking out for his students. Yeah. And I think that would be the same whether she was a Gryffindor or a Slytherin. Or I think a lot of people think that Dumbledore is this... Gryffindor obsessed, always have to, you know, win, blah, blah, blah. But I think he genuinely cares about, especially students who are around Katie's age, 
that's like the age Ariana was when she died. Yeah. So I can't I can't even imagine how hard that is for him to see somebody in that kind of situation. Yeah. At this point, Harry just flat out decides to press his luck and is like, Don't. where were you this weekend? <laughs> Where'd you go? He was at a gay strip club. You need to calm down. Right. Back off, dude. <laughs> no, what I think is really interesting, and it definitely surprises Harry, and probably Phineas and I jealous, too. But I was he, at a gay strip club. <laughs> <laughs> no, he says, I'm not ready to tell you yet, but I imagine I will in due course. And Harry's just like, you will? And he's just like, yes, but right now, we got stuff to get to. And he pulls a bottle of silver memories from his robe. Harry, before they get started mentions running into mundungus and hogsmeade and dumbledore's just like yes i am already aware that mundungus has been treating your inheritance with light fingers <laughs> and he's like i assure you that he will not be pilfering anymore and of course Phineas nigelis listening in from his portrait is just like what that mangy half blood stealing black heirlooms and just like disappears to go inspect his house i mean i kind of feel bad for him he can't do anything he's in a portrait <laughs> right <laughs> but at the same time it's like you don't have to call him a half-blood man he's he's still a wizard <laughs> well he's still from the black family ah right? yes yeah he is you know whereas you pure Sirius was definitely an exception and regulus eventually came to his senses although it led to his demise i think that regulus would be more like a background slytherin person's household like they're like Meh, i don't really like it that there are people who are muggles here but you know it's fine <laughs> yeah harry decides to meddle a little bit more and ask dumbledore if professor mcgonagall mentioned his suspicions about draco stop irritating me harry and dumbledore says that yeah i know I promise you we're taking all of the appropriate measures to investigate what happened. But right now, I'm more concerned about our lesson. And Harry is kind of resentful of this because if the lesson is that important, why did they go so long without one? But he stays quiet, makes it a point not to mention Malfoy anymore. I think he's getting used to people shooting him down and not wanting to hear it. So yeah, he's just know. a also, little Dumbledore already resigned knows, there. So. Dumbledore does already know. I kind of wonder if he had shared that with Harry. If Harry would have stopped being an asshole. If Harry would have been like, I knew it. And then like stopped trying to figure it out for himself. Yeah. I don't know that he would have been able to, though. Like, I think if he had been armed with that information, he would have done even more to try and investigate <laughs> thinking he was helping out. Yeah, I agree. So I get why Dumbledore made the decision to keep him in the dark about certain things because it definitely would have added fuel to the meddling fire. Harry's a mess. He is a mess. But like I said, he stays quiet and just watches as Dumbledore pours these memories into the pensive. And Dumbledore asks Harry if he remembers where they left off. And the last one, just kind of summarizing that they left off with the handsome muggle, Tom Riddle, abandoning his pregnant wife, Merope. He mentions that he goes home to his family in Little Hangleton and Merope is alone in London. And Harry is just like, how, how do you know she was in London? London? And he says that it was from the evidence of one Caracatus Burke, one of the founders of the shop that used to have the necklace they were just discussing. What a coinkadink. Hmm. <laughs> this is such useful information. And... Did they get this from Caractacus Burke himself? Or is this like a memory where Dumbledore went and interviewed him? Or none of the above? Well, all we see is he just kind of like swills the pensive and it causes this little old man to rise from the contents. So instead of like sticking their head in it, he pulled the memories up out of it. <laughs> Why y'all do that all the time? <laughs> I Probably guess so you just can so you can see it. more detail and stuff like that. But it's just like the little old man who says that they acquired the necklace from a young witch just before christmas many years ago because she needed gold badly which was very obvious because she was for a long baby pregnant, you, see. you see and she claimed that the necklace had belonged to slytherins which is something they hear all the time like oh this was slytherin's favorite this and this merlin's goblet right. yeah but they did a few tests on it some magical tests and like 
absolutely it had Slytherin's mark and was authentic. So she was telling the truth, which makes the necklace near priceless. And he gave her 10 galleons, which, which was, was our, our trivia, trivia question. question. And absolute bullshit. And even Harry's just like, are you kidding me? Only 10 galleons? And Dumbledore's like, well, Correctus Burke was not known for his generosity. And no, he, that douchebag, got the deals that he could get. I wonder how much he ended up selling it for. Near priceless, though. I mean, he specifically says it was near priceless. So, I mean, I don't know. So shitty. Yeah, very shitty. But anyway, Dumbledore says that from that... They know that near the end of her pregnancy, Mary P was alone in London and desperate enough to sell her only possession worth anything that was something that was super important to her father. And Harry's just like, why wouldn't she just use magic to help herself? That Like, she was a witch. Why would she s- just... Bleh. Harry doesn't understand trauma. <laughs> it's. I mean, Harry does understand he trauma, does, but he doesn't understand... But he- doesn't understand the lack trauma of response. strength and courage. Yeah, because he's a Gryffindor. Gryffindors don't understand that. Mary P is not a Gryffindor. She's not a Slytherin either. To do anything for herself? No. Well, I don't know. Giving the dude that you are obsessed with a love potion is pretty ambitious. And getting him to marry you and give I you guess a baby. So, that, but still. Like, that was a pretty Slytherin ambitious trait. Okay. She just has so much trauma and there's so much damage there that like when he left her, she really lost the will to live. I get it. At least she survived long enough to give birth, I guess. But is that really in at least since she gave birth to a super evil wizard? Who would have been completely different had she... Not that you choose to survive that kind of situation, but if she'd she taken better care of herself during... Could have chosen to survive that situation. I think if with her she magic, was in yeah. a better place. Yes. And that's what Dumbledore ends up explaining to Harry is that he thinks she stopped using magic when Tom Riddle Sr. abandoned her because... That makes me sad. What else did she have to live for after that? Like, that was her escape. That was her fantasy. That was probably the one thing that kept her going in that horrible situation she was in. And then she lost that. And I'm sure that she did love her son. I'm sure that... She just had absolutely no idea what she could provide for him in the state that she was in. And that wasn't enough for her. He was probably also very intangible because he didn't fully exist yet, you know? Like, she doesn't know yet what it's like to hold her child. And she never really got to. And like you were saying before, maybe if she had, it could have changed things for her. It's a complicated situation. And she could have, like, gotten a job at the orphanage and, like... That could have given her a stable place for him to be, at least. Yeah, but so. I think by then it was too late. Yeah. I think that she, there was just nothing left to her. I can't imagine walking somewhere having contractions. <laughs> I mean, I did walk to, into the hospital and walk into the, you know, I walked to the area where they had me. But boof, she had to be like walking around and she gave birth within an hour. So she was like way far into the labor process. Yeah. And I think that maybe if she had waited longer to reveal the truth to Tom Riddle and he had stayed with her the whole time and then she had given birth and it was healthier and like cared for by her husband who was loving her because he was forced to. But I think like had she been stronger when she gave birth and actually gotten to hold her son, then she probably would have found that will to live. Mm -hmm. But I think because she had to do so much by herself for so long and was so weak, it wasn't real to her. It was a rough situation. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, Dumbledore says that. He says, you know, don't judge her too harshly. And that's a really kind thing for him to say. Yeah. I think. I think he says that. I think he's right, too. All things considered. But I think he mostly says that because Harry thinks that she had a choice and his mother didn't. Yeah. And he is pointing out that, oh, your mother had a choice. She could have chosen to let Let you die. Right. I don't think she could have. 
No. <laughs> I don't think she could have. As but, a mother, I will say but she probably not. Could have. Like, she could have, yes. Unless she had you're that, that option. fucking mother that leaves your child alone for ten days while you go on fucking vacation. Right. Did you see that? I did, and I held Liam extra close oh, to me. Oh my god. I was like, what the fuck is Did you hear what the judge said to her? No. He said something along the lines of just like you did to your child you're going to be locked up for the rest of your life the only difference is the jail will feed you i mean 10 days without food sweet baby like (sighs) some people some people should not be parents should not be parents i do however think that sometimes when you have a tiny human and you've gone through a lot of trauma i think that frequently that can help you Get that will to get past the trauma and raise a really good human being. I think it can, but I also think it can just continue the cycle. It can. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. But I don't think Maripay would have continued the cycle. I think she would have been a stop all done cycle. I don't know. It's hard to say. She literally had no decent role models and was willing to drug somebody to get what you want like I, she wasn't she it's hard to say hard to say and we'll never know unless yeah. you write a fan fiction about it and send it to me please <laughs> but it's so emotional right. and so tough and it is a huge what would have happened if thought mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely but like i said dumbledore points out that Mary P was very weak from her long suffering physically and mentally yeah and never possessed the courage that harry's Lily mother did. had yeah so like i said it's just so sad and it's i think a good villain origin story it really is really is but then dumbledore tells harry all right let's go harry's like to where where are we going? Where are we going? And Dumbledore says that this time we're going to enter my memory, which I think you will find both rich in detail and highly accurate. I love it. I know. And I think it's frustrating for me to realize that in the movie, they aren't picking up for where they left off. This is where they're starting. True. They have done no memories at all whatsoever. Zero. This is the first one. Yeah. And they missed a perfect opportunity to show the flamboyance of Dumbledore. I know. I can't believe. Well, part of that, I think, is because so they enter the pensive into Dumbledore's memory and they end up on this bustling old fashioned London street. And Dumbledore's just like, there I am. And you see his younger self, Youngledore. Youngledore. That's the name. Yeah. Youngledore is walking up this London street wearing a flamboyantly cut suit of plum velvet. And I think in the movie scene, there is a chance the suit he was wearing was was plum. Flamboyant and purple. (laughs) But they desaturated the scene so much to make it look like a memory. memory. Like it wasn't full black and white. No, but it was like but it was so desaturated. Sepian? No, it called? wasn't even that. Sepia. No. It wasn't Sepia. even that because sepia is that like warm orangey brown color. This was a very cool like bluish grayish tone. But <laughs> like it how was Twilight still, was shot? Yeah. <laughs> it was still possible that that suit was purple. I don't know if it was just my brain hoping that it was purple. It's pinstriped. And not velvet. It was not velvet. It definitely was not velvet because velvet texture will still show in oh, yeah. mostly black and white. But like I Len thinks that I'm tetrachromatic because of the way that I see individual colors mm-hmm. and how easy it is for me to differentiate when they're very similar. So it could be entirely possible that because of that, I could see that that suit was still plum color. Intended colored. to be purple, yes. But it also could just be that my brain was just really fucking hoping that suit was plum colored. I mean, I'm there with you, honestly. But what a disappointing missed opportunity to show Dumbledore's true personality. Because you know, you uh-huh. know, he picked that suit. He was like, 
Hmm. Yeah. I want purple today. Absolutely. The moment, too, where Harry just goes, nice suit, sir. Yeah, which is so Why? funny. Why would they think we don't need that? And Dumbledore giggles. Yes. And it's just great. Yeah. <sighs> Why would they think we don't need that? It's also disappointing to me because the book specifically describes Yungledore as having still long hair and beard, but that they're auburn. They did make them darker, so it could have been like what you said, but auburn. But they weren't. They were shorter. Maybe a, oh, I thought they were darker. They could have been darker too, but like his hair was shorter, his beard was nowhere near as long. Oh, his everything about him is exactly that's what you're saying. Yeah, okay. everything about him is exactly the same, except his hair is auburn. I really just wanted the long beard and the long hair in an auburn color. He also didn't look much younger. His hair was just different, and he was in a s- hundred and fifty, give or take. <laughs> I really just. You know, I wanted, I mean, I wanted Yumbledore is what I really wanted. But yeah, Jude Law. Come on. Ugh. But no, we got Yungledore in the book. Young. Yungledore. And Yungle. just bad haircut Dumbledore in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> true. True, true, true. It did not look Auburn to me. Granted, like I said, desaturated to the point that you couldn't really tell, but it didn't look I, Auburn to me. Yeah. That's not the feeling that I got from it. I do, however, absolutely love the meme where they compare Yumbledore with y- Yungledore in the movie. And they're like, how did this happen in like 20 years or whatever it was? Or is they clearly Teaching. you're not a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. True story. Exactly. All my regals have come from teaching. Yeah. The few gray hairs that I have are 100% from teaching. I have teaching. a lot more gray hairs than you. I got really good genes when it comes to stuff like that. Like my... Both of my parents. My mom started to get a few and started dyeing her hair around 40. But it was because she found out she was pregnant with my younger brother and did not want to get mistaken for his grandmother. Oh. (laughs) And my dad, he's now pretty much all gray, but he's 71. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Anywho. Nice suit, sir. Like, why is this not a thing? Disappointed. I think they did a really good job showing the space like going up to the orphanage I think it looked really good as far as what I imagined instead of it just like not lining up at all with what I imagined I think they did a good job outside of like leaving out the other orphans and the whole conversation which we'll get to I agree I think my biggest disappointed with this section is Like, they started it off well, going into the memory. Mm -hmm. I love the way they do it visually, too. Like, the desaturation. I get why they do that. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I get it. But the way that the smoke, when he poured the Mm -hmm. memory in, I wish it had been more silvery, Mm -hmm. to be honest. But I agree. It gave more contrast visually to do it black. But the way that it started off swirling in the liquid of the pensive, and then you had that aspect still in the down memory. in the yeah. transition and then they like solidified it was really nice mm-hmm. it looked great it really gave that ethereal this isn't real this is a memory aspect of it yes absolutely and i appreciate that i don't appreciate not having a plum suit but you know whatever i'll take what i can get right <laughs> and then like they walk to the orphanage In the movie, you actually get the name of the orphanage, Mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah, it's Wool's Orphanage. Yeah, and you don't actually get that in the book, so it was just kind of neat. It made it a little bit more real, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the movie just skips over all of this delightful stuff that just shows why I love Dumbledore so much. Yes. His improv skills. I know, right? But you have... The regular Dumbledore and Harry following Yungledore up the road to this orphanage through the Iron Gates. They describe it as being a very bare courtyard and the building being grim and square surrounded by high railings, which I feel like the movie nailed. I think that they did a really good job of, yes, making this look very grim and and depressing right and the specific description from the book is what it looked like in the movie like that's what i pictured but we actually get to see harry and dumbledore follow yungledore up the steps and he knocks on the door and then there's a little exchange with 
a scruffy girl in an apron who answers it and is just immediately like weird dude in a purple suit like Mm -hmm. and i wanted more of that an eight-year-old girl being like i don't uh, think she was eight because she seemed to work there oh i they have the orphans cleaning the orphanage that was the vibe i got I just figured she was, an, I'm sure she cleaned it too, but I just got the impression that she was just another one of the younger girls who worked there, but not like a child. Oh, I thought she was an orphan. Because Miss Cole started working there when she was just a little bit younger than Mary P. Mm-hmm. So I just figured it was something like that, another oh, girl. I've like, always I just assumed think, it was an orphan girl. I never thought that they'd let the orphans answer the door. An older one, but I wouldn't. Maybe, I don't know. More responsible. But yeah. I think because she described her as a girl. My brain was like, oh, under the age of 10. Mm. (laughs) But maybe that's not the case. So that's how I always imagined it, though. It's funny how brains can just see different things. Mm -hmm. And we don't know for sure because the movie didn't give it to us. Nope. Maybe the show will. We'll see. Youngledore explains that he has an appointment with the matron. He believes her name is Mrs. Cole. And the girl's just like, uh... Okay. One more. <laughs> Hold up. And then just screams up the stairs. Mrs. Mrs. Cole. Cole. And invites him in. Which is nice. But eventually, I don't think it takes that long, but eventually Mrs. Cole comes down the stairs and they describe her as a skinny, harassed looking woman. She looks very anxious, but she's not looking at them. She's talking to somebody over her shoulder. Yeah, because... Another helper, it says. She says, Billy's been picking at his scabs again. And then she just like chicken pox on top of everything else. Yeah. And it's just a very, I think it's a really funny, like you work with kids. This is kind of what you have to deal with. Like yeah. there's always pile up of things. So it was a cute Yes, moment. I totally get that feeling. Yes, all the time. And then she's like, yeah, you're here to talk to me. Cool, 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 cool. Let's Thank go. You. All right, let's do this. I do love the fact that she also has that moment where she does finally look at him, takes in his appearance because plum velvet suit and just Shock. gapes at him. And he's like, good afternoon. <laughs> as polite as can be. Explains that he's Albus Dumbledore. And he had sent her a letter requesting an appointment. And she's kindly invited him there. So I'm here for an appointment. Do you remember my letter? Like, And she just kind of blinks and's like, better come to my office Mm -hmm. and he follows her to actually she says better come to my room which i thought that was so funny and i started to word it that way and i was like it's definitely described as an office slash sitting room but it was just some better come to my room like where are we inviting him Interesting. (laughs) interesting but it is like her office slash sitting room area and she's got her desk that she sits behind she has him sit in what is described as a rickety chair across from her at the desk. And Dumbledore continues his explanation, like I had mentioned in my letter, that I'm here to discuss Tom Riddle and the arrangements for his future. And Mrs. Cole is like, are you family? No. And he's just like, no, I'm a teacher. I've come to offer him a place at my school. And so she wants to know about the school. And I'm genuinely surprised that he gives her the real name. He tells her it's called Hogwarts. Now, granted, this is not in a day and age where you can just Google Hogwarts and find shit out about this school. And I'm sure that there's no way for people to know of the existence of every school everywhere. I am intrigued that he doesn't tell her the truth. Just because she does have to look after Tom when he's home. Like, I feel like it would be beneficial for her to know, like, he's going to a magic school. And they tell parents so why wouldn't you but tell the like, legal guardian? Yeah, I feel like parents is a little different than someone who's not going to have anything to do with him. I guess they could always wipe her memory after he's no longer at the orphanage. Yeah. But I feel like it's with the statute of secrecy and it may have been even more different back then. It just seems a little odd for somebody to be in the technically guardianship of a wizard and then not have it explained to them. At least to some extent. Yeah. I don't... He's like, he's going to go to school with He'll be back me. in the summer. Yeah. That's about it. And, That's- and like, you don't know where you're sending him. There's no credential. Like... Well, she thinks she saw credentials. I guess so. <laughs> I guess. But it... 
as a caretaker of children, it it, it kind of stresses me out. Like, if somebody came to take one of my kids, which I work with two year olds, so it's a little different, right? But if somebody came to take one of my kids and I didn't recognize them, and they were like, "Hey, they're gonna go to a school." Or, what, you know, like, oh, I'm going to take them to another daycare. Well, and it does sound like she is legit doing that at I, first. I, because I hope, she is yeah. literally like. But then he gets her drunk, so I guess. Well, no, not even just that. Because she's literally like, why are you interested in Tom? And Dumbledore says that they think he has qualities, qualities they're yeah. looking for. So she's like, oh, does this mean he's won a scholarship? How could that be? He's never entered for one. And Dumbledore's like, well, his name's been down since birth. And she's like. Who registered him? He's got no family. Like, Oh, my gosh. And Harry's like thinking to himself, this is clearly an inconveniently sharp woman. And I Dumbledore <laughs> obviously agrees because at this point, he literally slips his wand out of his pocket and picks up a blank piece of paper from her desk, waves his wand and hands her the paper and says, this should explain everything to you. And then... Whatever spell he puts on her, probably some kind of memory charm. Yeah. She looks at this blank paper for a while as if she's reading something and says, everything seems to be in order. So she thinks she knows everything she needs to know to feel comfortable sending this child to Hogwarts with this teacher. I mean, I don't think that there could have been a really good explanation. I don't know. I guess I have millennial parent brain where I'm like please I need to know everything that's happening <laughs> but whatever but again she's also not the parent and she even does admit that she it, doesn't think people will be sorry to see the back of yeah. them so like she received some kind of magical whammy yeah. to get her over her suspicions yeah. and is now like wait a minute I can get rid of this kid for a good majority of the year okay I'm on board yes I love this part so much too because then it specifically mentions that she notices a bottle of gin and two glasses that had clearly not been there before we love on her gin desk. yeah and looks at it and then offers dumbledore a glass and dumbledore just smiles oh yes of course please i will definitely take that gin that i just made magically appear on your desk so that you would offer me some i kind of even wonder if maybe that was included in a little bit of that magical whammy he put on her I'm curious, though, because according to Gamp's law, you can't create food. Well, I don't think he created it. I'm sure he summoned it from inside her desk because you know it was there. <laughs> Probably. Listen. I mean, he could have summoned it from anywhere. Yeah. It's not like he's weak with the magic. Weak with the magic. <laughs> I'm weak with the gin. I am not. I love gin. I do, too. Len is allergic to it. So it's the one liquor that I can keep here for myself that I don't have to worry <laughs> about him drinking up. The audacity of the movie execs to not let us see flamboyant Michael Gambon and then cutting out drunk Mrs. Cole. I know. Worst. It would have been great to see. And I do love the fact that he literally got her drunk so that he could get more information from her about Tom. Yes. Because that's what he starts asking about is Tom Riddle's history. Confirms that he was born in the orphanage like he had suspected was the case. On December 31st. Mm-hmm. Which sucks for those Zodiac things because he's born on December 31st. He's a Capricorn. I am December 30th. I'm literally the day before him. It's always Voldemort. And I, as a Capricorn, am not Voldemort. I would like somebody else, please. You are definitely nothing like Voldemort. No. For one thing, you have a nose. I do. <laughs> a very cute nose. In case you see me in person, my nose is the cutest She nose. does have a very cute nose. It's true. It's true. I love this part with Mrs. Cole getting drunk because she pours herself and Yungledore a very full glass of gin each and then proceeds to just throw hers back in one get it, get gulp. It. Love it. And then she pours herself another and takes a very large gulp as they're discussing Tom Riddle Jr. being born in... The orphanage because she says that she remembers it really well. It was literally right after she started. And she was just a few years younger than Merope. So it probably really hit her to see somebody that was close in age to her going through this. So that would mean Merope is probably 21, 22 would be my guess. Maybe. It's entirely possible that Mrs. Cole could have been like 16 at the time and Merope was 19 too. Oh, yeah, maybe. 
<laughs> she drinks her gin. She says that it's New Year's Eve, it's cold. The girl has the baby. And then the next hour, she's dead. Yeah, she says she shows up, has the baby within an hour, and dies within the next hour. And she shoots some gin again. Yep. And Dumbledore, young Dumbledore, is asking about... If the, she said anything about the boy's father. The dad. And she said, as a matter of fact, <laughs> she said he hopes he looks like his papa. And I can imagine a very drunk woman saying this. And then this is and the part. And she was right to think that. This is the part that gets me every time. <laughs> because she was no beauty. Yeah. Girl, get it. Oh. Stop. But. I mean, Mary P was a little rough looking. I assume so. It must have been even worse by that point. Yeah. My goodness. But. By this point, she's gotten enough gin into her system and seems to be enjoying herself and having an audience to tell this story to. Yeah. Makes you like a lot of people really do like that kind of attention, especially I figure in a situation like this. If he when, looks like Jude Law, please pay attention. Right. To me. <laughs> but not even just that. I'm just saying like when I think about how I spend all day with my students and then I get home and, and I just want to bitch myself, about something. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to wait several hours before my husband gets home. The moment he walks to in that adult. door, I like start talking his ear off. And I feel like she probably goes through something similar because it sounds like a lot of her helpers are also Younger. essentially still just children. And then she's constantly taking care of children. She probably doesn't get to interact with adults a lot. Yeah. So having an adult to talk to about a child you're not particularly fond of is probably... Like, oh, I thought it was weird. I've been thinking he was weird for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So I just really imagine this being very similar to what I put my husband through after a long day (laughs) where I haven't gotten to talk to an adult in a while. Yeah. And then you add gin into the mix. Whoo. But, you know. But she also tells Young Gildor that Mary P had requested she named the boy Tom for his father, Marvolo for her father, and that his surname was to be Riddle. And she's just like, right? Funny name, I know, when she says Marvolo. Girl drunk. And then mentioned that she died. they named him that. And after she died, no Tom, Marvolo, or any Riddle came looking for him. So they kept him at the orphanage, and that's just where he's been ever since. Helps herself to even more gin. Get it, girl. And then just sort of absentmindedly mentions that he's a funny boy. I like that she mentions he was a funny baby. Yeah. And I think that when she says funny boy, Dumbledore initially thought. Ha ha funny. Like strange things happen around him. Magic funny because he says. I thought he might be. I thought he might be. But then when she says that he was a funny baby, too, who hardly ever cried. I can't imagine that. A baby right? that hardly ever cried. That's concerning, I think. Something was going on there. If he hardly ever cried, he hardly ever got held. Yeah. And a lot of studies have proven the more you hold your children, the more their brain develops. So kids who are not held a lot as babies are usually 30 to 50 percent less emotionally developed yeah that makes sense so funny boy indeed yes and then she said that he was odd when he got older and that's when dumbledore was just like what do you mean by that so i think he initially thought funny boy oh weird magic-y things happen around Mm -hmm. him odd wait a second that's different different and she starts to explain but then (laughs) stops because she's just like is anything that I say here going to stop you from taking him to your school? Like, he's definitely got a place there, right? And Young Gildor assures her that he does. Like, I'll take him away, whatever. You know, yeah. like, this is happening. And she's like, You're not gonna whatever. Change my mind, whatever. <laughs> and so she explains that he scares the other children. Dumbledore's like, he's a bully? So you're saying he's a bully? And Mrs. Cole's like, well, that must be it, but I've never been able to catch him doing anything. To be fair, even non-magical children are good at hiding. That's true. When they're bullies sometimes. She just mentions these nasty incidents oh, dear. that happen. There was a thing with Billy Stubbs's rabbit, and Tom insists that he didn't do it, and she doesn't know how he could have even done it. But then she goes on to say that 
the rabbit didn't hang itself from the rafters. How did, did an it? orphan get a rabbit? Was he just like, can I have a rabbit? <laughs> and they were like, okay. Maybe he caught it from outside or something. And maybe he rescued and a Mrs. baby Cole bunny. And really chill and is like, yeah, sure, you can have a rabbit in the fucking orphanage. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Or maybe he was dropped off there with it. Oh, that would be sad for it to die. Oh, maybe Tom Riddle was jealous that he had a pet or something. I don't know if he gets feelings like that. Get your snake, man. Right? And Billy Stubbs is mentioned again, but he's the one that had the poor chicken pox. The chicken pox. Which maybe it's not a coincidence. Maybe Billy bothers him and Tom gave him maybe. the chicken pox through magic. Yeah, but she says the only thing that she knows is that Tom and Billy argued the day before it happened. And then she mentions they went on a summer outing. They go like once a summer to the countryside or the seaside and they were in the seaside and Tom brought Amy Benson and Dennis Bishop into a cave for exploring. As they said that they just explored, but that afterwards Amy and Dennis were never quite right. I don't know how to feel about that. I know. What did he do? Like, did he torture them? Did he? That would be my guess. Yeah. And then she looks at Dumbledore and says that there have just been a lot of funny things. And she doesn't think many people will be sorry to see him gone. And Yungledore is just like, you do know he's coming back at least in the summer, right? Dude, her her comment is better than a smack on the nose with a rusty poker. I'm like, bruh. <laughs> well, when I was doing the summary for this, I was like... Mrs. Cole was like, that's better than nothing. But then I was like, no, I got to use this actual yeah, phrase. Actually. Like, how do you not use the actual phrase? Whack on the nose with a rusty poker. Because, yes, she is essentially saying that's better than nothing. But she's also not. Yeah. At this point, she stands and says, I suppose you would like to see him. And Uncle Dor also stands, says very much. Now he's probably super interested in this kid. After these stories. And... She walks out of the office. He follows her. They go up stone steps. The entire time she's back in that teacher mode where she's calling out instructions and admonitions Mm -hmm. to the helpers and the children. And Harry notices that all of the orphans are wearing the same grayish tunic. And they do actually look reasonably well cared for. I think that I like that he thinks that. Like his first thought when he sees kids is do they look like they're cared for? Well, he knows. And because he knows. But he does say it does seem like a grim place to grow up. Yeah, and I'm sure it is, especially when you desaturate it to the point they did in the movie. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Eeyore lives there. But they stop in front of the door. It's the first door on the second landing. And Mrs. Cole does knock first, but she, like, knocks and then just pushes the door open. And she says, Tom... Someone's here to see you. She tries to introduce him as Mr. Dumbledore and just messes up his name. I don't know. Dumberton? Dumberton and Dunderbore. I don't know if this is being drunk or just not remembering his name or a little bit of both. Yes. But it's pretty hilarious. It's Mr. Great. Dumberton and Mr. Dunderbore. The way that Jim Dale does it in the book is he makes her sound drunk at she this point. She does sound so, very drunk yes. in the book at this point. Which... She very well could be. She had three large glasses of gin. Get it, girl. a very short amount of time. (laughs) And who knows if she's eaten today with all the chicken pox and stuff. Right? But she just sort of starts to explain why he's there and is just like, I'll just let him tell you. And Harry and the two Dumbledores walk into the room and Mrs. Cole closes the door behind them. In this room, it is very small. Very bare. There is a wardrobe. There's one chair and an iron bedstead. And this boy is stretched out on the bed. says on the gray blankets. Reading a book. I wonder what he's reading. But we never know because that's not what he's doing in the movie. No. And we don't even get there. We just get a quick scene of Yungledore walking into the... And he's not even that Yungledore. He is not that Yungledore. Which I guess he wouldn't be that young. I mean, it's only like 50 years ago, so... And he's a wizard, but... He was, what, a hundred and... A hundred years old, so... He was a hundred and something, like, but, like, in the teens, so it was, like, a hundred and fifteen or something. So he'd been, like, in his 70s? Yeah. At this point? 60s, 70s. 60s, 70s, yeah. I think he looked older than He did, that. yeah, he did. 
but we just get a like waft of this scene where he walks into the building. We hear Mrs. Cole talking, and we, we don't even get introduced that it's Mrs. Cole. No, it's just I don't even describe her as Mrs. There. Cole, even though we know it is. Yeah, it's and just a woman's voice. Yeah, and she's like, "There've been some nasty incidents," and blah blah blah, and then she goes to open the door. Yeah, it lines up without any of the details. Just a waft. It is a waft of a movie scene. <laughs> I don't even feel like we can really talk about the actress who played her. Because no, because you get her for two seconds. She's it's just like a poof. Yeah. And she's gone. Now, had they given us the drunken scene where she drinks all of the gin. I wish. And I especially where the part where Dumbledore uses magic to glide yeah, over did we the forget suspicion. That this is a like, magic come Movie on book. right yeah had they done that we could have had something more to talk about but you know they left out a lot of good backstory on we don't even know like any if you just watch the movies you don't know anything about Voldemort's parentage at all no we've talked about that before and we don't even know how he got at this orphanage yeah no we he's just some random kid that he's they just found. some random kid at the orphanage that Dumbledore goes to pick up mm-hmm and you're like, what? Why, why do you think we don't want that information? Especially since, as we talked about, that situation really affected why he became mm-hmm. who he became. And I think that's why we want to make our Ponder Pondering what it is. So, yeah, I think that our Potter Pondering this week should be, what do you think would have happened to Tom if Merope had survived? I think that there is a lot to unpack there. And we are very interested in your thoughts on that as well. So give us a two minute pondering. Yeah, I want to hear it. I want to know all your thoughts. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok or just record it and email it to us if you live in a different country and can't call. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. And here we are at this week's Wizarding Word, which I am super excited about slash kind of bummed about. (laughs) It's a twofer. So Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone is going to be screamed with a live orchestra at Edinburgh Castle. And that is amazing. The reason why I am bummed about it. (laughs) It's happening on... July 14th, Sunday, July 14th. At this point, my husband and I are literally planning on being in Edinburgh like a week and a half after that. Boo. We're literally just going to miss it. And I'm like, oh my God, when is it happening? When is it happening? When is it? Not while I'm there. Maybe they'll extend it. That'd be really cool. We got to go watch Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. We did Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets. You guys the same did, way, but yeah. we as in. Me and you, yeah. Me and carly and then our husbands and and the baby and the baby we got to go watch jurassic park up here in cleveland with a live live orchestra orchestra, and it was really really cool my husband and i saw lord of the rings the we saw fellowship that way too when i was pregnant and chamber of secrets and it was amazing and we very much enjoyed it so if you live in the cleveland area that's a blossom yeah in the summer and it's nice it's very cool they do a lot of different movies it, this one in Scotland, the Edinburgh Castle, it's going to be the critically acclaimed Royal Scottish National Orchestra conducted oh, by Justin Freer. That sounds lovely. And they're going to be doing the entire first film. <laughs> it's so freaking cool. So if you live there or you can get there, it sounds wonderful. It says you'll be watching Harry's first adventure on an epic 39 foot wide high definition screen Ooh. with John Williams' legendary work playing alongside. That sounds like wonderful so this is just a very short article that we found on the wizarding world and we'll share it just so you can read it too but it's got the tickets going on sale they're actually on sale now in the link through Ticketmaster to buy tickets so if you are able to get to that area that you should go check it out and then tell us all about it oh absolutely take pictures share them with us please Make us jealous. Yes, definitely do that. And I'm going to go to the Edinburgh Castle myself, at least after the fact, and just be sad that I missed it, but get to see it. (laughs) 
But yeah, so that is what we got for that. And we'll have this up on our Facebook page so you guys can check it out too. That will drop us into this week's trivia question, which is what trinket does Harry think Dumbledore might have from Tom Riddle's collection? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag very astute will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at foxsakepod at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to become a patron, you can find us on Patreon at Fox Sake Pod. Patronage starts at $2 and will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag access to our Discord channel, chats, and more. Check out our page for details. Any support you can give is greatly appreciated. So join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 13, The Secret Riddle, and the fairly corresponding film scenes, plus another little section that really doesn't fit in anywhere. Thanks for listening. Hope you hear us again. I'm Carly. I'm Ellen. And we are... For For Fox Fox Sake. Sake.